Yes. So it took me a while to kind of understand what was broken in a large corporation and government agency. And the problem, surprisingly, is not that there aren't innovative people in large companies or governments. Let me say that again. There's probably, or in a different way, there's probably more innovative people in companies and government agencies than there are in startups. It's a big idea. It's, it's not that they don't have that same talent embedded in their companies. Those individuals who work there have different personal risk pr profiles. They won't bet their family's mortgage or kids' trust fund or, or college education on it, but they're there. The problem is, is that the way companies are built, the nature of the corporation is built to execute a repeatable process. They have found scale. That is, companies exist for scale. And when you have scale, you build process and procedures and manuals and metrics and OKRs and KPIs and financial metrics and internal metrics. And you build culture that is basically, think of it as turning the crank. People come to work to do a job. And that's not bad. That's, in fact, it's not bad on multiple levels. It's, as I said, it's how companies historically have scaled. And it's how 99% of most people are comfortable going in, doing a job, going home, and living the rest of their lives. Because as a reminder, only crazy people want to go out into the unknown and, and chaos and start something new. But it's actually the fact that corporations are designed historically, underlined historically, for operations in steady state environments for scale. And by the way, that could go on forever, except the world is never steady state. That is, you never have a monopoly forever. You know, maybe Google for the next 10 or 20 years, Microsoft thought they had it for 20 years. All those things tend to, the auto companies had them for maybe 80 years. Those are crumbling. So business models eventually collapse. And when they collapse, this steady state model of process, procedure, et cetera, doesn't work anymore. And so how do you deal with disruption in a company or government agency? By the way, when a company fails, you know, the economy doesn't go out of business and something else replaces it. But government being disrupted or a government agency that's a different story. That's a national problem. 20 or 30 years ago, two professors, Tushman and O'Reilly, actually gave this a label, what companies need to do. They called it an ambidextrous organization. That is, companies need to figure out how to execute and innovate in parallel. And Clayton Christensen struggled with this as well. Companies need to do both things, and they're very different things. And because the motivations are different, because the processes are different, because the mindsets are different. It's very hard for a company with execution DNA, who could have been the world's best executor, to survive in a disruptive world. That's why almost, not, not every, but almost every large company that faces a transition in customers or technology or markets almost always fails to make that transition. Not all of them, but most of them. All those computer companies in the 1980s that had to deal with personal computers, only one major company managed to make the transition. It was IBM. The same with like web and mobile. Everybody failed, including Microsoft. And a new set of companies like Google and, and others emerged that figured out search and mobile. The incumbent software companies just kind of blew it. And I'll start with it's because there is no formal innovation doctrine. An innovation doctrine is What's the rules and processes I need to deal with in innovation? How do I set up an ambidextrous organization? What's the role of leadership? How do I, in fact, communicate the mission? What are the processes and procedures that need to be set up in parallel? What's an end-to-end -end innovation process? How does that work? Is there an innovation pipeline in the company? All those things need to be done as a strategy from the top down, not via, again, heroic innovation. Remember we were talking about we celebrate the heroes? Well, that's because none of this was being discussed on the, at the board level, on the C level. There was no process for innovation. And again, 30 years ago, McKinsey actually gave a kind of a, a nice overlay for if you're thinking about how to do innovation in an, amb in an ambidextrous way, that is, again, think of that word meaning chew gum and walk at the same time. They said there are three horizons of innovation. Horizon one is 
how do we add more features to existing products or how do we get more existing customers or better supply chain, et cetera. Horizon two is how do we get adjacent markets or how do we sell our existing products to new segments or how do we use our technology to find new opportunities? And Horizon three, Horizon three is what Amazon is great at and Apple under Steve Jobs was great at. How do we spin out and create entirely new businesses, completely new businesses and disrupt ourselves? That's what startups do. And it used to be that took decades or years. Now, in fact, you could just do those almost overnight using existing components. But again, those three horizons give leadership a way to think about, maybe this is a framework I should be thinking about. And by the way, companies have advantages here. Where startups just need to generate all this stuff internally, companies could partner, they could aqua hire, they could buy IP, they could buy products. They could do lots more things than startups can. And some of them do it successfully, but for most of them, this is hard because it's a major mind shift for the C-level and boards. And I just want to remind everybody who's in a large corporation, think about who your CEO and board is. The odds are they came up through the ranks as world-class executors. That is, the founders of your large corporations are typically long gone, except for tech companies where they're still running them. But in almost every other industry, the founders are gone and the executors are running the show. And most often your board is staffed with world-class lawyers or bankers or finance people, but almost no crazy people. 